Welcome to Take a Wonder with Shebs. My guest today is Waja Dubé. My discussion with Waja was how he broke into the travel industry and why it's so tough for someone of colour to do so and why there still is a lack of diversity and inclusion. All of that and much more. Let's take a look. Waja, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time. How have you been? Yeah, good. Thanks, Shebs. Thanks for having me on. So for people who don't know who you are, just tell us a little bit about yourself. My name is Waja Dubey. Uh, I am uh, uh, from Botswana in the States, but based here in New York City. Um, And I work in the travel industry as a travel marketing representative for a company called Index Select. So we uh, focus on representation for luxury travel brands uh, all around the world. And I particularly focus uh, on the Africa space. So that's my main nine to five. (laughs) We'll come on to a little bit about your work in a bit later. I just want to ask you the first question on, for yourself, where where did the love for travel for you begin? And I guess a little bit about your journey into it and how you grew up. I actually am an expat. Uh, My my father was in the Foreign Service for Botswana. So I grew up actually moving around the world. I was actually born uh, on mission. So uh, I've actually been moving around. I've been on planes since I was about six months old. Um, But I decided to move to Hawaii for university, went to Hawaii Pacific University, and uh, kind of ironically and surprisingly enough, uh, fell into the hospitality program there. Uh, I thought I was going to do accounting. Uh, That was a big save. Thank God for that. Um, But I uh, studied hospitality there, and I actually was uh, planning on... um, you know, working for hotels, but I, my love for hospitality and travel was definitely on the more travel side. So I've, you know, been traveling around the world my whole life. I just love exploring, you know, new cultures. And of course, living in, in multiple countries, I lived in nine countries before I was 18. Um, so uh, it's just a lot, uh, you know, a lot of just running around. So then when I joined the industry, um, I joined as a, actually as a tour operator, but that was because I was working at a safari lodge in Botswana for a summer internship. Uh, and I met this amazing company that uh, was looking for someone to do actually pretty much do exactly what I, uh, what I wanted to do, which is pretty much travel around, sell travel, talk about Africa um, and, and keep coming, you know, kind of bit back between the continent, uh, America and the rest of the world and discovering the world. So that's how I fell in. Nine countries is a lot of countries. Yeah. <laughs> so out of those, what place really gave you the transformative experience and transformative life experience? Each country uh, definitely uh, played its own part. Uh, I think developmentally speaking, um, I was living in between uh, England uh, and Beijing when I was in middle school and high school. So that really was uh, the most, those were the really the most developmental years, I would say. Um, and that was very special because I was also living with a lot of international people, international communities. So it really did spark my, uh, my interest in learning about more people and more cultures. Process of getting into travel. Mm-hmm. So studying and getting the education, how did you actually fall into the industry? What was the journey like? And I guess what were the challenges faced when you were breaking in? I'm actually one of the rare people that I even find in the industry um, that I work with, but with even with, within my colleagues in my circle who actually studied travel and industry, uh, travel industry management, which was my degree. Um, so I fell into it really just kind of luckily and you know took all these paths But even with that, doing uh, education for four years in travel and hospitality, I didn't actually go into the jobs that were designed for the degree, which was mainly uh, food and beverage, cruises, airlines, hotel management, that type of stuff. Working on my side and and with the people I work with now, which are many tour operators, uh, a lot. uh, Of course, I work with a lot of properties, uh, but also travel consulting uh, and doing representation and marketing. Um, that education whole block did not exist. And for the most part, it still does not exist for many university programs. So um, I was you know, just very lucky to fall in with a company that was looking for someone who knew Africa very well um, and wanted to live in, in New York. And that's where I was going to be based. So it was quite uh, very well, well planned and, and serendipitous for me. But for most people coming in, they um, it, it's not easy because there is no one defined path. Uh, a lot of people find it through their own kind of circles and are looking for travel companies. A lot of people have also started their own. But I'd say in general, there's no one defined path like a lot of other careers. So it's kind of 
got to be something that starts with the passion and then you're trying to figure out how can you make money off of uh you know selling the world and, and traveling the world and then from there a lot of people can find the companies there's a lot of people i've met over the last few years and they've not necessarily traveled as much so they're breaking in just starting their travels now and they're very young do you feel as though you have more of an edge if you've traveled for five, six, seven, eight years or 10 years and then get into the industry? Firstly, I'd say, you know, everyone's a little bit different, but I wouldn't say that you need to have a ton of travel experience to jump in. Uh, I know people that have, you know, only maybe even just traveled the States and they had a just a passion for it. And, you know, then they found a company and they just started working on it. And through that experience, working with other travel consultants, getting sent by work to go to visit other destinations, you know, they were learning on the job. A lot of people, a lot of travel in general, uh, especially on the side of what I do, and that also speaks for on behalf of me, me as a representative and representation, but also also travel consultants, operators, um, you know, it's a lot of learning on the job. Uh, I think one thing that I find quite common, and I educate, my job for the most part is to educate operators and, and travel consultants on destinations and, and on my products, that they might not know, not know Africa at all. Uh, again, that's my speciality, uh, but they've got a passion for it. They've sold the world, but literally never you know, sold anything in Africa, never touched the soil of Africa, whether that's Morocco, Egypt, or South Africa. Um, but, you know, once they go and I can educate them for, for, for days on end and they'll show that passion. But then the minute they go, they'll understand it. So, um, uh, you know, so long story short, no, I don't think you need to travel to get into it, but uh, it definitely does help. For someone of color like yourself and myself, it's a bit daunting at times when you look at the industry. And I've done an article recently where I looked at diversity as a whole within the sector and even the companies I spoke to talk about diversity and inclusion they lack diversity and inclusion did you find that a challenge and is it uh, still a struggle absolutely it is definitely still a struggle um in and, and in many ways um just unfortunately uh, I mean this, this is a multitude of reasons as to why this is um uh, and we'd, we'd need to have two other shows to go over all of them. But uh, I think, you know, you're kind of looking on the surface level. Uh, if we look at the marketing, for example, and by that, I mean, even if you go and type in a destination and you look at the, the ad that they show, it's not a person of color nine times out of 10. Uh, usually it's a 35 to 50 year old white person, usually blonde haired, uh, you know, whether that's a, uh, a safari or a beach in Jamaica or anywhere, um, you know, they usually don't look like people of color. So off the bat, it almost seems like a restrictive place to get into. And then, of course, then when you get into the industry, you know, uh, it's it's not very diverse from um, uh, from from the from the top down. Uh, and again, there's a multitude of reasons for that. Uh, I think a lot of people of color have not been able to to get in, uh, not because of their skill, not because they're not well traveled, but uh, it's you know, a lot of the industry looks the same. Uh, and there are a lot of amazing companies that are doing their part to to try to change that and just bring more diversity without you know displacing anybody. Um, but we really have to look at the companies and look at the makeup of them and realize that a lot of companies are quite homogenous. And you know, obviously, um, some companies do want to change and they want to really. Um, market and sell more to a more diverse audience that's more money it's just you know simple mathematics um but a lot of times when you've got companies where everyone looks the same and they sell to the same demographic um then bringing a new business or even attracting new hires who don't look like them can be a challenge so i mean i've got a lot of friends uh, uh Black uh, and BIPOC and other people of color who um, have often even started their own travel companies because they haven't been able to get in. Or if they do get into a good travel company, they do feel uncomfortable because they're the, they're the only person of color and the voice of color in a room, especially when we're talking about destinations where that's where we come from, whether that's Africa for me, uh, India, Asia, what have you. And the perspective that you can bring as a person of color, talking about a destination that you're, you know, perhaps from, or even, you know, somewhat adjacent to, um, is not really listened to. The marketing is still done to, as I said, the people in that advert. So it's um, it's a long road, but there's a lot of different, um, you know, uh, facets to it, like I said, but a lot of people are trying to really change it for the better. It's going to be a, a long process. Yes. The 
BLM movement obviously struck a chord with a lot of companies and they pledged, I guess, trying to get more diverse and inclusivity within the sector. But actually, I read a quote that you, I think you spoke to Forbes and said, there's not been much change since that pledge. And yeah. you got you had an interesting reason for that. Why, why, why is that though? I think that the reason for that is, for the most part, financial. The pandemic, unfortunately, hit a lot of, you know, hit everybody hard in a lot of ways. And while people did want to make change, um, they also needed to stay afloat. And um, it was just a lot for a lot of people, you know, and this is a, a people business. And so, you know, companies were trying to make change. They were also trying to literally stay afloat. They wanted to hire new people and diversify their staff, but they couldn't hire one person, regardless of what their skin tone was. So, um that was a big factor. Uh, but at the same time, I think it really did bring a lot of, it put a, it shone a, a big light on the companies that were actively trying to make change and, and the, you know, still doing it now. And um, adversely, the companies that pledged to make a change. Uh, and, you know, now that, you know, travel is coming back, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's almost better than it's been in two years. Um, the companies that have gone silent and have not said anything since they made that pledge or whatever they said they were going to do. And there's plenty, there's more companies that um, have have not fulfilled their promise than companies that have. And that really has to be um, highlighted. I spoke to a couple of industry experts and they sort of said, there's no, the, the personnel isn't there and that's an issue. But then I spoke to other, another person that said to me, well, maybe they've just given up trying because they've been rejected that many times. Mm -hmm. How many rejections can you take before you think to yourself, you know, I might as well look elsewhere. So that could mm -hmm. be an issue. That That's possibly why. I, I actually disagree with that. I know a lot of people have said that. And, um, and I've had people call me and tell me that. Um, it's not true. The people are there. Um, where are you looking is the first question. Um, there's a great organization called the Black Travel Alliance. And, you know, they, they've come up to really, and there's more, you know, organizations like this for uh, a lot of uh, minorities who are in travel organizations, whether that's bloggers or whatever, that are coming together to, you know, and, and working with um, companies who are actively seeking more BIPOC staff. And, you know, that's what I tell them. When these companies call me, I say, call, you know, organizations like these ones. Also, um, you know, this is uh, speaking on behalf of people in America. Uh, you know, we have historically black colleges here. Um, you know, we can recruit kids out of college. We can go to specific, specifically minority, um, you know, colleges and then recruit. So um, it's untrue to say that. And secondly, there are, uh, as you know, as the stats have, have proven in 2019 and uh, 2018, uh, African Americans and people of the diaspora are the largest are the fastest growing, I'm sorry, fastest growing spending demographic uh, in the world right now, or at least in America. And um, a lot of those people did not want to, for the most part, work with, uh, with a lot of travel companies because they did not see themselves in the marketing or who they spoke to when they called to do a trip. And so, but these are people also were interested to work in the travel industry. So what did they do? They made their own companies. Uh, so a lot of people going to your point of rejection, uh, that's definitely a factor. But I think right now we're at a point where um, companies are, again, now that hiring is coming back kind of across the board, we are seeing companies actively trying to hire. Um, I think it's not just on the companies as well. I think it's also on the BIPOC community to be also be actively looking, um, you know, uh, and to be uh, at the events and at conferences and, you know, on job fairs and you know, uh, on these websites, like I just mentioned, looking for jobs, you know, if they have a contact in travel, they should also be looking. So um, both sides have, have a part to play, but definitely the, the companies themselves need to do a better job of, um, uh, of really reaching out, but not just within their insular community, which is really what it mainly has been, uh, then rather looking out to more diversify their staff. I think we can all agree that there's a a lot of work still to be done and it'll be interesting to see what happens in the, the coming years and mm -hmm. high dive, how diverse it will be in the next few years. I want to take it on to your actual work. So just tell us a little bit about in detail exactly what you do. Working as a, as a for a representation firm, um, there are plenty of hotels and, and, and tour companies around the world that don't have uh, a company 
uh, here in the States. They don't have an office here in the States or in North America. So we act as their office, uh, handling all their marketing, their sales calls, um, all events, uh, anything they essentially need here in the States, essentially working as a wing of their company. So we go out to all the major um, travel consultants, all the major travel agencies and tour operators here in North America and educate them uh, on the destinations that we that we are operating in. But then, of course, are the clients that we represent, whether that be uh, a camp, lodge, hotel, resort, uh, a tour operator, what have you, anywhere around the world. Do you work remotely at the moment with this job or is it, do you have an office that you go into? I'm remote. Um, I, uh, I've had this job even since 2018, but I've been remote. And, I was say uh, to you, has it been remote ever since the beginning? It's always been remote. Yeah, this is actually my second uh, job with a representation firm. My first one, we had an office, but you know, even with that, we are truly road warriors. So <laughs> if it wasn't, you know, the times that we're in right now, we would be on the road almost every other week. Your speciality, as you said, is Africa. Tell the audience what it's like to travel Africa. A lot of people, uh, I think, have this mysticism about coming to the continent. And, you know, 54 countries, there's just so much to see and do. And, you know, no one country is the same. Uh, A lot of people need to really remember that when they're coming. But whether you're coming for culture, a safari, uh, you know, to visit tribes or to go for, uh, you know, spas or adventure, um, the continent really has everything. Um, I think a lot of people, again, have a kind of a misunderstanding of uh, Africa and even, you know, what each country has to offer. But when they come, they get almost a spiritual experience when they're coming. And again, this is whether it's Egypt, Morocco, Namibia, Botswana or or Tanzania or any of the other countries. Um, And I think that it really, whether you're doing cities or being out in the wild, uh, I think that every person that comes to the continent just falls in love with it for one reason or another. Um, And and I don't know, it has this amazing mysticism uh, for it, even for myself. You know, I live in the States, but I go uh, back to the continent, you know, quite often. Um, And even if it's me going home or to a new country, um, it's just it's always great to, for me to be home, and even if it's not my country. As the world has opened up now, why people should consider Africa as a destination? Because one of the questions I've asked other guests in the past is why hasn't Africa been on the list? And a lot of people said to me that it's the expense. That is the big problem. If you're living in the United States, coming over to, let's say, South Africa, Botswana, Zimbabwe, anywhere, you're going to have to have a lot of money. And as a family, you're looking at nearly $10,000 plus. So what could be done potentially to, as things have opened up now, so people can get to Africa and be confident enough to say, I can have a good time and it's money well spent as well. I think, you know, no matter how much you spend, whether you're a three-star client up to super luxury, the money will be well spent. Um, Yes, it will cost, it will be an expense because, uh, you know, it, it will also depending on what you want to do. If you want to fly to Zanzibar right now, well, there's a flight leaving JFK in a couple of hours, you know, you could be there tomorrow morning. It's not that expensive. Um, but I think a lot of people, when they think of Africa, they have like a safari in their mind. And that's only about seven countries, eight countries of the whole continent. Um, so even if it's like Egypt, for example, is hot right now. What I would firstly say is that, uh, the pandemic almost was uh, was was very almost good in a sense for Africa. Um, yes, we all you know lost money and just you know we uh, 2020 first of all say was supposed to be one of the biggest years in travel uh, in over a decade, and you know like everyone else at the continent of Africa was hit. But when people started traveling again, they didn't want to go to cities. They wanted to be out in places that they could, first off, decompress because of everything that we've been going through, but also feel uh, safe about how they traveled. And Kenya um, was actually the the hardest country almost in the world uh, in 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 2021 uh, and in 2020, I'm sorry. And that was because like many other African countries, they um, unfortunately, because of things like Ebola and other outbreaks, were ready for uh, something like a pandemic. And so they had the safety protocols in place that other countries did not get into place or couldn't even figure out for months, months later, if not even a year. So it was, I think Africa has actually succeeded and really led the way um, over the past two years and really shone um, to really convince a lot of people to come down because it's been safe. Uh, people want to decompress. You can do a mix of being out in the wild as well being um, you know, um, in cities. 
Um, there, this protocol is literally at every single place from the airports to every single hotel. The, uh, the staff are in place and also um, people are still going about their lives. They're not on lockdown, uh, but they're doing it safely. Uh, and I think again, with having so much of a content to, to, to explore um, that it, it, you can do even one country instead of you know kind of hopping around and you can do one country and really take that in for two weeks and again you can do it at a five-star level and spend the ten thousand dollars like you said but you don't have to you can do it as a backpack if you really want to um and so there's different price points for different people and um there's just so much to do and see especially for the people that have done other continents already and they're thinking well what next then uh, if you've not done africa then there's there's just so much for you to see what makes the continent Africa unique. You've traveled around a lot, around, I'm assuming quite a lot of these countries. What mm -hmm. is it that makes it so unique? It's again, it's interesting because, you know, as a continent, I don't think that um, there's any one thing that makes Africa unique. It's what makes every single country unique. Um, and again, you have that's 54 unique stories that I can tell with one thing about each of them. Um, I think that it's really the people when it comes down to it that there's a vibe, you know, whether you're in Ghana and Accra partying or you are meeting, uh, you know, the Bushmen of Botswana, this is the vibe of the people that is very welcoming. Um, I find no matter where I am in the continent, it's always been very welcoming. People always want to know your story and they always want to share theirs. Um, and they always, um, again, no matter where you really are, they always want to really you know, welcome you into their culture, into their homes, show you their history, um, as well as make sure that you're having a good time. And that's just the African way. Where do you see yourself then in the next few years? I guess progression is obviously key, but where do you see yourself progressing to within oh, the industry? Man. Big questions. Uh, you know, always looking for um, the new opportunities to particularly for me, um, promote my content and, and also promote diversity within travel. So those are kind of my, uh, my career, uh, kind of pillars, if you will. So anything that really has projects going on around that, I'm always doing that, but representation, you know, I personally love my job because I get to talk about and represent, um, the most amazing clients, every single one of the clients that I represent and that my team represents, you know, we, uh, we believe in them and they believe in us. So it's very easy to do my job and bring on new, uh, new properties and new clients because I have such a list <laughs> of clients that I love personally that I would love to represent. So, um, telling their story for me has always been, um, has always been a passion, um, but spreading the word also and developing more, um, tourism experiences in Africa uh, and even for someone that works in safaris and truly I love it I've been going on safari since I was eight years old um, has been to uh, show more sides of uh, more perspectives of the continent and what each country has to offer so anything that's around those projects that's uh that's what I'm doing. Do you see yourself staying in the United States or potentially moving away to a different continent different place to live working somewhere else? Now I'm a bicontinental man I think I've uh, I've been pretty uh, happy to to live this kind of bicontinental life. I would love to spend more time in Africa, um, and uh, and you know I'll be hopefully making those plans uh, eventually. Uh, but you know living between New York City and uh, and Botswana. Uh, having my two homes there, having my work between uh, New York here, which is, of course is a great access point to the rest of the world. Um, and to move any other, anywhere else other than those two is gonna they're gonna to really convince me. So England's out of the question there. <laughs> England is out, man. I've done it twice, and I'm a gooner to to the death. Uh, <laughs> Arsenal fan since I was a boy, um, and uh, so I'll come down for the matches. Yeah, but um, no, the weather is done after living in Hawaii. I'll never do this oh. weather again. We've talked about travel. So, what does travel mean to you? Obviously, you've, your career is in it. What does mm -hmm. it really mean to you? To me, it's honestly everything. You know, again, like I said in the beginning, I you know I was born traveling literally born on mission. Um, I have some of my best experiences traveling, I, whether that was me backpacking in high school and college with my friends, um, or, you know, as my job now, um, everything has always been really 
uh, been centered with travel being a, a focal point of that. Um, so it's life for me. It's, it's literally, I've made my best friends, even my girlfriend met on travel. Um, I don't, I, I can't stay still either. So uh, I need to be on the road. I need to just be out there. And most importantly, I'm a people person. I love to meet people and, and, and just, you know, know I'm around a whole, uh, you know, hodgepodge of uh, of people that you know almost can resemble something like a United Colors of Benetton commercial. That's my happy place. So um, you know, I only get that when I'm traveling. So yeah, that's what it means to me. Is there anything on your bucket list that you've not done in terms of travel that you want to oh sort of go see? <laughs> How much time do you have? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, there's been a couple of things that I was supposed to do before um, before we shut down. The two number, the top two are to go gorilla trekking in Uganda, Rwanda. I should say, I have to say top three. Uh, climb, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, uh, going to Egypt, uh, and as weird as it sounds, and I love to say it now because people still um, find it very strange, is I've never been to Italy. It's not unusual that you've not been to some of these places. And the gorilla trekking has been high on my list. I had that yes. on my list to do in 2020, but obviously things didn't happen. And I still haven't been able to do it, but that is something I want to do as well. So you've got some good good choices, I would say. Yeah, there's still plenty of the world to discover for me. You know, yes. so I've, I've done quite a bit and I'm very proud of myself. But, uh, you know, uh, I don't I don't set my laurels. There's still plenty to, to do and see. Travel is a big hobby. What else do you like to do away from your work? Well, between the uh, the months of, of August to May, watching Arsenal is a top priority. Um, also, martial arts, eating and, and enjoying, just exploring, you know, whether it's my own local uh, city or, or, or the country or wherever else. Um, but yeah, just adventuring. Uh, and um, and obviously right now a lot of these things have been limited so you know just educating myself on anything I can on culture history um, of course without travel um, uh, and uh, and martial arts and martial arts is one of my loves just before I let you go can you tell us where we can find you uh, reach me on Instagram it is WD Nomad uh, for Instagram uh, and then of course indexselect.com is our website um for for our for our, our representation firm so people can always reach me there i'm also the vice president of uh apta which is the association for promotion of tourism in africa uh the northeast chapter based here uh in new york so we are putting everything uh, that has to do with africa out here um so you can reach that at apta.biz um and yeah i think those are the main ways how to how to find me why well, i want to thank you for coming on again i really appreciate your time and we'll speak we'll speak very soon Shebs, thank you so much. I'm so glad I could be on and I really hope that uh, we can uh, travel together to hopefully grow the tracking. A fantastic discussion. And if you want to get in touch with Waja, all of the important details are on your screen now. That's it for Take a One Low Shebs. Hope to see you very soon. Until next time, bye for now. <laughs>